When you think about businesses that are selling through the roof, like Skims or Allbirds, sure, you think about a great product, a cool brand, and great marketing. But an often overlooked secret is actually the businesses behind the business, making selling and for shoppers buying simple. For millions of businesses, that business is Shopify. It's home of ShopPay, the number one checkout in the world. You can use it to boost conversions up to 50%, meaning way less carts going abandoned and way more sales going through to checkout. Upgrade your business and get the same checkout all birds uses. Sign up for your $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash income, all lowercase. Go to shopify.com slash income to upgrade your selling today. Shopify.com slash income. Hey friends, I'm Rachel Grohl and I'm your host for the Hearing Jesus Podcast, where I help you to know God and to make Him known. Today we're continuing the second half of Mark chapter 8 as we continue our devotional Bible study series that I'm calling Pressing In. And just as a reminder, if you would like to dive deeper on the content, we have a couple resources available. We have the kids show that covers much of the same content. We have the journaling prompts, we have the family discussion guides, and ad-free episodes. All of that is found at the link in the show notes. If you're just joining us, I would encourage you to go back and start listening at the beginning of the Gospel of Mark because we're working our way through a handful of verses at the time. Now, today's passage really captures a pivotal moment in the ministry of Jesus where he begins to reveal the true nature of his mission and as the Messiah, what that means for those that follow him. So I'm reading Mark 8, 27, and I'm actually going to go through 9 verse 1 because, and I don't know if you recognize this, I know I've talked about it in the past on the podcast, we call those the addresses, like the chapter and verses, our kids call them the addresses in the Bible. The addresses were not necessarily in the inspired part of scripture. They were added in later to make it easier for you to figure out how to find things. But the way this was originally written, that first verse in chapter 9 would have been part of this passage. So verse 27, Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked them, who do people say I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. But what about you? He asked, who do you say I am? Peter answered, you are the Messiah. Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. Now, in today's passage, we're reaching this turning point in the Gospel of Mark. And yes, it's the halfway mark because we're finishing up chapter 8, and there's 16 chapters total, but more so, Up until this moment, much of the ministry of Jesus has focused on miracles. We've seen miracles, we've seen healing, we've seen teaching, we've seen deliverance. The disciples have witnessed incredible displays of power. And then the crowds, of course, have marveled at what they've seen, and that's what's drawn in this huge following. But now, as Jesus leads his disciples towards Jerusalem, the focus shifts. Jesus begins to reveal the deeper, more challenging truth about his mission and what's coming, what's lying ahead, not just for him, but for everybody that follows him. And so this passage is really crucial for understanding who Jesus is and what it actually means to be his disciple. It challenges them and it challenges us. It challenges our expectations of the Messiah and it is this invitation to embrace a life of surrender and sacrifice that comes with following him. 
So the scene begins with Jesus leading his disciples toward the villages that are set around Caesarea Philippi. In this region, which is on the northern edge of Israel, it was known for its pagan worship, and it was associated closely with the Roman Empire. It was a place where power and influence and foreign gods and rulers were on full display. In fact, Herod the Great had built a temple here in honor of Caesar, who was the Roman emperor, and the city itself was named after Caesar, Caesarea Philippi. And so you can tell what the priority is in this place. And it's an unlikely place far away from Jerusalem and the religious centers of Israel that Jesus chooses to ask his disciples some really important deep questions. He starts with saying, who do people say I am? And then the disciples respond by listing the various opinions that they've heard from the crowds. So some say Jesus is John the Baptist reincarnate. Some people say he's Elijah, who was the prophet who was expected to come before the Messiah. Other people think he's one of the prophets that God sent to deliver a message to the people. And so those answers reflect the fact that people did have a high regard for Jesus. They did respect him and they saw him as somebody that's powerful, that he was inspired by God, but they had not yet grasped the full truth of who he was. So then Jesus asks a more pointed question. He says, well, what about you? Who do you say I am? And Peter is the one that steps forward and he makes this bold declaration, you are the Christ. Peter's confession is a significant moment in the gospel of Mark because he's recognizing that Jesus is not just another prophet. He's not just a teacher. He is the Messiah, the one that they've been waiting for, the one that is sent by God to deliver the people of Israel. And this confession marks this turning point in the understanding of the disciples of who Jesus is, what his identity is. And so That's interesting because what we'll see later is Peter and the other disciples don't still fully understand what it means for Jesus to be the Christ. So yes, he can say, you are the Christ, but he doesn't quite understand what that means if he is the Christ. And like a lot of the Jews at the time, there was this expectation that the Messiah would come and be this powerful political leader, someone who would overthrow Rome, that would establish an actual kingdom on earth and do it through a military victory. And so their vision for that was this triumphant king who would come and restore Israel to their former glory and bring about justice and peace. But the mission of Jesus was bigger than that and harder than that. In our own lives, I think we have these expectations of who Jesus is and what it means to follow him. We may have this belief that following Jesus brings comfort or success or happiness. But as we start to see in this passage, the path of discipleship is not always easy. In fact, we call it predictable resistance. The minute you start following God's plan, the enemy is going to try to attack. It's just predictable. But Jesus calls us to follow him on this road that leads to the cross, a road that is marked by sacrifice and surrender and persecution. That challenges us to let go of our agenda, of our expectation, and lean into trusting God's plan. Even though it's difficult, it's ultimately for our good, and it's for the impact of the kingdom and for God's glory. And so after Peter confesses, Jesus begins to explain what it really means for him to be the Messiah. He tells the disciples that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the religious leaders and then be killed. And after that, in three days, rise again. That was not what the disciples were expecting. In their minds, the Messiah was supposed to be a triumphant figure, and he was going to defeat Israel's enemies, and he was going to establish this kingdom. The idea that the Messiah would suffer and die was not on their radar. It was unthinkable. And Peter, who's still holding on to these expectations, pulls Jesus aside, and he starts to rebuke him, which is So a Peter thing to do. But in Peter's mind, a suffering Messiah did not make sense. He was motivated in love. He just couldn't reconcile the idea of Jesus as a Messiah who would be rejected and killed. That did not match up this idea he had of this victorious king. And so Jesus responds to Peter in a rather unique way. He says, get behind me, Satan. He says, you do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. 
I think Peter's reaction is telling. It reveals how difficult it can be for us to accept God's plan when it does not align with our expectation. Because like Peter, we want Jesus to fit into our vision of what we think he should be. We may want him to bring victory without suffering. We may want him to bring success without sacrifice. But Jesus, he rebukes Peter. And that reminds us that following him means surrendering. Surrendering our agenda, surrendering our idea of the way things are supposed to go, and leaning into trusting that God has the greater plan, even when it involves our pain and our loss. That's hard. And Jesus uses strong language when he calls Peter Satan. And it's not necessarily because Peter is evil, because in that moment, Peter is trying to divert Jesus from this path that God set before him, this path that leads to the cross. It was done in love. But Satan's temptation in the wilderness, that's exactly what he offered him. He offered Jesus power without suffering. And Peter is echoing this same temptation. And Jesus knows that the only way that salvation can happen for them and for us and for the world is through suffering and death. Peter was motivated in love, but the enemy was operating through his words. I think for many of us, there is a temptation to take shortcuts in our faith because we don't want to necessarily go through the difficult parts of following Jesus. We want the easy parts without realizing that that also comes with the difficult parts. But Jesus calls us to embrace the cross. What does that mean? Well, it means trusting that it's through surrender and sacrifice that that's where we find our life when we lay it down. And so just as Jesus, his path to glory went through the cross, our spiritual growth goes through the cross too. It involves challenging. It involves suffering. It involves predictable resistance. It's part of it. Now, it doesn't mean that we can't have peace in the midst of that. It doesn't mean that we can't see God's hand provision in the midst of that. But sometimes it's hard. Greetings and God bless. This is Tyler Burns. And this is Dr. Jamar Tisby. And we want to invite you to check out our podcast, Pass the Mic, Dynamic Voices for a Diverse Church. Pass the Mic has been speaking directly to the core concerns of Black Christians for over a decade. On our show, we've got interviews from theologians, historians, actors, activists, and so much more. Not to mention heartfelt, open dialogue on some of the heaviest issues facing the church in the United States. Be sure to subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, or wherever you get your podcasts. We'll see you there on the next Pass the Mic. The mic. Hi, I'm Haven, and as long as I can remember, I have had different curiosities and thoughts and ideas that I like to explore, usually with a girlfriend over a matcha latte, but then when I had kids, I just didn't have the same time that I did before for the one-on-ones that I crave, so I started Haven the Podcast. It's a safe space for curiosity and conversation, and we talk about everything from relationships to parenting to friendships to even your view of yourself, and we don't have answers or solutions, but I think the power is actually in the questions, so I'd love for you to join me, Haven the Podcast. After Jesus rebukes Peter, he turns to the crowd and He explains this to them. He basically lays out the cost of following him. And he says, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. And, you know, that's a statement that is challenging. It's countercultural. But that's what the teaching of the gospel is. We live in this world that we are consumed by this idea of self-promotion and self-fulfillment and self-gratification, instant self-gratification. And yet what we see Jesus do is call his followers to do the opposite, to deny yourself. What does that mean, to deny yourself? Well, it doesn't mean denying yourselves these small pleasures or comforts, meaning you can't eat chocolate or you can't watch TV. It means surrendering your entire life 
to God. It means letting go of your desire, your ambition, your plan, and submitting that to God's will. It means saying, not my will, but yours be done. It's following up that example of Jesus when he's in the Gethsemane, that surrender. And Jesus also calls his disciples to take up their cross. In Roman times, the cross was a symbol of death and suffering and humiliation. And so to carry a cross, you were on your way to your execution. And so when Jesus tells them, take up your cross, he's calling them to be willing to suffer and even die for his sake. That would have been a shocking statement for them to hear because they were familiar with the brutal reality of what crucifixion was. I think sometimes we can think of that in the metaphorical sense, like take up your cross. But no, the reality is, is be willing to lay it all down, including your life. Taking up our cross means being willing to endure things like hardship and rejection and sacrifice. It's for the sake of following Jesus. It will happen. It means being willing to lay down our lives for the sake of the gospel, even when it costs us something. But Jesus calls us to follow him. This isn't just a call to admire Jesus and admire his teachings and call him a good teacher or a good rabbi or a good prophet. It's a call to walk the same path that he walked, a path that ultimately leads to the cross. Following Jesus means following his footsteps, even when the road is difficult, even when it involves suffering and sacrifice. And that is demanding. It's challenging. It's hard to think about. It's hard to stomach. But it comes with a promise. Because Jesus says that whoever loses their life for his sake and for the sake of the gospel will find it. So in a world that tells us to seek comfort and security, Jesus offers us this paradox. The way to true life is through surrender of your life. When we give our lives to God, we receive a life that is so much better and so far greater than anything we could have achieved on our own. So I ask you to consider, what does it mean for you to truly follow Jesus? Are you willing to deny yourself, to take up your cross, to follow him even when it's difficult? Are you willing to surrender your own desire and ambition for the sake of the gospel? The call to discipleship is not easy, but that's the path to true life. Towards the end of this passage, starting in verse 35, there's this rationale that Jesus gives for his demands. He says, whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. I think in this world, we are so often taught that the way to happiness and fulfillment is through this idea of self-preservation or accumulation of things and success. But Jesus, he takes that logic and he turns it upside down. He tells us that the way to true life is not by holding on to it, but by giving it away. It's by surrendering our lives to God and to his will, even when that involves sacrifice or suffering. That's when we find true life. That's the life that God intended for us. So Jesus goes on and he asks these two penetrating questions. He says, what good is it for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? And I think we need to sit with that for a minute because these are questions that force us to consider our own priorities. What are we striving for? Are we focused on gaining success and wealth and approval? And is that at the expense of our relationship with God? See, Jesus reminds us that nothing in this world is worth losing your soul. Pursuing the things that the world offers is a distraction from what really matters, which is our relationship with God and where we're going to spend eternity. We live in this culture that just prioritizes material success and branding and platform and personal fulfillment and all the things. But Jesus is challenging us to see life 
through the lens of eternity, the things that are going to last. Because the things we achieve in this life, whether it's wealth or power or popularity, all of that stuff ends the moment we die. What matters, what lasts is our relationship with God and how we live for his kingdom while we're here. And Jesus calls us to lose our lives for his sake and for the sake of the gospel. And as we trust in him and we do that, we find this life that is so much richer and so much more fulfilling than anything this world can offer. And and if you've been somebody that has chased that, you know. I mean, I spent time chasing that before I fully decided to chase Jesus. And I know that you're always seeking more because it's never enough to fulfill you. Jesus gives a warning in verse 38. He says, if anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the son of man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his father's glory with the holy angels. That's a powerful reminder. It's a reminder that our allegiance to Jesus has to be the same behind closed doors as it is in front of crowds. It has to be unwavering. Even when the world rejects us or ridicules us or we get attacked for our faith, we're called to stand with Jesus because our ultimate reward is not even in this life, but it's in the next one. And then verse one of of Mark nine, I'm going to go on to that because it's this conclusion of this entire section with this promise. He says, truly, I tell you, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see that the kingdom of God has come with power. That verse has been interpreted in a lot of different ways. And you can see even sometimes it's lumped into the next section of verses. Some scholars believe that it refers to the transfiguration which is coming next. It's right before the transfiguration. And that's, we'll study that tomorrow, but that's where Peter, James, and John witnessed this glimpse of Jesus in his glorified state. Now, there are others that interpret this as a promise that is pointing to the resurrection and the coming of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, which is also coming very quickly. And that's really when the the disciples start to experience the power of uh, the kingdom of God in like a new way. But others see it as this reference to this final return of Jesus. Either way, the message is clear. The suffering and death of Jesus is not the end of the story. The resurrection reveals the power and the glory of God's kingdom. And as his followers, you and I get to share in that victory. And so this path of discipleship, may involve hardship and sacrifice and suffering, but it also leads to this promise of eternal life with Jesus. The promise gives us this hope that as we walk this path of discipleship, as we face this predictable resistance, the cross is not the final word. The resurrection is. Let me say that again. The cross is not the final word. The resurrection is. And so while we may experience hardship and rejection here in this life, we have this assurance that God's kingdom is coming in power. The resurrection is the ultimate proof that God's power is greater than anything this world can offer. And ultimately, the victory has been won. So as we face these challenges in our journey, there's comfort there. There's comfort that there's this promise that God's kingdom is already breaking into the world in the scholarship world of things we call it the already, not yet. It's already breaking into the world, but it's not yet complete. The power of the resurrection is at work in our lives, and we are invited to participate in the fullness of God's kingdom. We may not always see the full picture, but we can trust that God is working all things together for his glory and our good. As we kind of reflect on this passage, it reminds us of the high cost of following Jesus. But we're also reminded of this incredible promise that comes with it. Jesus calls us to deny ourselves, to take up our cross, to follow him, to surrender. Not because the path is easy, but because it leads to eternal life. 
His invitation to discipleship is an invitation that we find ourselves by losing our life for his sake and for the sake of the gospel. And it's laying that down that we can pick up the life he has for us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the powerful truth of your word. We confess that like Peter, we often struggle to understand the way of the cross. We want to follow you, but sometimes we hold on too tightly to our own desires and our own plans. Help us to trust in your will, even when it's hard, even when it requires sacrifice. Lord, give us the strength to deny ourselves, to take up our cross and to follow you with all our hearts. Help us to live with eternity in mind, knowing that the things of this world are temporary, but your kingdom is eternal. God, give us the courage to stand with you, even when it means facing rejection or ridicule or persecution from the world. Lord, we thank you for the promise of the resurrection and the hope of eternal life with you. As we walk this path of discipleship, remind us that you are with us every step of the way, leading us to the glory of your kingdom. We give you all the praise and the glory, and we ask your strength as we seek to follow you faithfully. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey friend, every day when I finish the podcast, I feel so confident that this is one of the things that God created me for, and my journey is not unlike yours. I had a season in my life where I was doubting God's voice. I felt insecure about the things I thought he might be telling me to do. If you are in that place, I want you to know that I offer spiritual direction and life coaching to help you get unstuck. Maybe you're struggling with something and need an objective biblical opinion. Maybe you need some help working through something that feels a little heavy. Maybe you feel called to write or start your own podcast. Or maybe you just want to learn how to hear God's voice more clearly. For me, when God started to reveal his plan for my life, I found my purpose. And part of that purpose is to help you learn how to grow in your relationship with him. My heart is to help guide you in this area so you can step confidently into the calling God has for you. If you would like to start spiritual direction or life coaching, I am opening up space for a couple more clients this quarter. You can head to shehears.org forward slash coaching to learn more. My name's Preston Sprinkle, and I host the Theology in the Raw podcast. Theology in the Raw aims to help believers to think Christianly about theological and cultural issues by engaging in curious conversations with a diverse range of thoughtful people. I have conversations with a wide range of different guests who come from different perspectives, and no topic is off limits. Sexuality, abortion, politics, LGBTQ, warfare, violence, marijuana, immigration, you name it. If you have a theological or cultural issue that you have been wrestling with, with over 1,100 episodes, we've probably talked about it on Theology in the Raw. Along with conversations with various people, I also address questions sent in from my audience every month. And occasionally, I will talk about some of my latest research projects that I'm currently working on. Theology Nara is not for everyone. It is uncut, uncensored, and I don't give trigger warnings. So check out Theology Nara through your favorite podcast app.